Welcome back, bike farmers. Here we are with a perfect example of what I would call a practical bike. Um, this is kind of my jam at the bike shop. Uh, these 90s or 2000s era mountain bikes that are really just general purpose bikes. This one already has some nice upright handlebars. Um, the saddle isn't terrible, but I am gonna replace it with something that I think is a little more appropriate. I have uh, giant branded saddles that are really comfortable. Um, this one's gonna be sort of sporty because uh, we do have a suspension fork on this one and could be used as a mountain bike if uh, somebody would want to. You know, kind of like an entry level thing just to dabble and see if they want to get into it. Otherwise, it's going to be a perfect, just really comfortable, all arounder, good used bike for someone. Um, I think it's a real um, missed part of cycling in a lot of cycling stores that I call, um, some people call them bike shops. I like to call them cycling stores. There are still some bike shops, but you know, it's just uh, not a lot of really practical stuff being offered by the market or by the industry, um, and that uh, bothers me. I love these old bikes, I love rescuing them, putting them back into service, and um, I really just focus on bikes for regular people. Um, you know, I joke that in my bike businesses I avoid cyclists at all costs. Um, I just don't see uh, the point in selling people things that they don't really need or they don't really benefit from, you know, really lightweight, uh, really aero, um, you know, internal routing. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff out there that are all selling points. Disc brakes, um, you know, hydraulic disc brakes, give me a break. Uh, tubeless tires, give me a break. Like, you know, there are advantages on some levels of cycling, but literally for 98% of the, 99% of the population, that stuff is just really impractical. These bikes are cheap to purchase, um, they're easy to maintain. They're easy to tune up. Um, you know, a bike like this, you can pick up for a hundred, hundred fifty bucks on Facebook Marketplace. Take it to your local bike shop for a hundred dollar tune up, even a hundred fifty dollar tune up, and you're still coming out ahead. You're gonna have a bike that lasts you the rest of your life. It's gonna service it um, just great, uh, and that's that's all most of us need. So that's what I focus on, and I love it when something like this comes um, across my across my desk, as they say and I'm able to tune it up, uh, make it mechanically sound, everything's working as it should, and find it um, a, new, a new rider, a new owner. And uh, the, you know, they come in here looking for something cheap. Um, the other thing is, is you know, I think this is a really good alternative to what you'll find in the big box stores. You know, um, I see a lot of bikes from like Target and Dick's that are kind of like this mid-range that really aren't that terrible, but they're selling for 350, 450 bucks, brand new. And for 350, 400 bucks, you can buy one of these for me, tuned up, uh, ready to go. And it's such a much better bike. Um, the components on it, the manufacturing, um, you know, this one may have been tuned up once before. And by the time I give it to the second tune up, it's really just gonna be working great for a long time. Um, but the sunk cost is actually much less on something like this. Those uh, Target brand bikes, or uh, um, the the dicks or you know that sort of thing sporting goods stores those bikes lose so much value they just don't have a lot of resale value um, and then especially the consumer grade products that come from Walmart or those sorts of things I mean you spend 150 or 200 bucks um, even 250 on some of those bikes and you're out that money right as soon as you leave um, that, that store and those bikes are not good they're broken brand new I've been saying that for decades uh, we can do things to improve them and maybe to get them rideable and functioning and so on and so forth, but there's no guarantee there either. So with one of these, there's always a trade-in value. Um, you know, I'll give you, you know, not quite half, but, you know, a good considerable amount of your money back if you bring it back to me and trade up. And so your sunk cost is really only a couple hundred bucks, but you're riding something of quality. And uh, this is just something that's been really coming up um, a lot in uh, my business lately people coming in with these bikes they got such a good deal on at the big box store and they just don't know why the brakes aren't working or whatever and i i have to have this conversation with them that it's like there's not much i can do for them i might be able to make some improvements but i can't guarantee my work and it's really dissatisfying for me it's dissatisfying for the customer um, so i like to have an option and say this is a really high quality product 
that's going to work really well for you forever cheap to maintain parts are easily um, replaced even used ones you can find in bins all over the place any co-op or here um, these bins are full of these parts for these bikes and uh, it's just such a more economical better way to do it um, and actually enjoy your ride with something that shifts and stops and doesn't make all kinds of noises and rattle apart and so on and so forth so a little bit of my uh, cycling ethos um, practical bikes for practical people is a slogan I came up with when I opened my shop uh, never really stuck but I still kind of live and die by it and um, I found a way to be profitable too which I think is very important that you know if you're gonna dedicate your life to doing this you have to make a living um, and uh, I've done the nonprofit thing too and um, you know begging for money and raising funds and that kind of thing just isn't my jam I want to actually solve problems provide a service and get paid for it um, and I've, I've figured it out with these used bikes on how I can do it and uh, it's been working for me and uh, I'm really grateful to be able to make these videos and share that with you and maybe turn a hobbyist or two into someone who wants to flip bikes um, you know it could be a side hustle or uh, I don't know like me I've turned it into a living so um, thanks for coming along on the bike farmer ride I'm gonna get started on this one I'll explain to you all the things I do I mean it might even be a 20 minute tune-up um, but I might take my time on this one and get into it a little bit and show you some things that I can do to really uh, improve the the saleability of this bike and clean it up pretty good um, you know things like um, rotating the tires or um, you know there's a little bit of rust on the noodle here uh, we can clean that up there's all sorts of little things um, we'll, we'll see what we can do um, let's get started yeah the fun begins on this one right here with the the seat post and seat clamp so the customer right away was like yeah the seat clamp doesn't work um, I think two things are going on is it's backwards so the there is a slit cut back here so you always want the clampy part back here and you can see they pounded on this and bent it um, and so this isn't gonna really work too well anymore I could bend it back or maybe find a new one but if we just flipped it around like that then let me show you so this is how I have it you can see the the slit is back there they had it like this right so you're kind of clamping over here and it sort of works but it wasn't working really well if you have it like this then the whole thing can kind of smoosh together the way it's designed the other thing is is I, I generally and always um, like to drop some tri-flow in this whole area here to help things move smoothly um, so you don't end up having to pound this with a hammer and bend the crap out of it like has happened here all right getting into the bins seat clamps seat clamps <clears throat> it's actually seat post clamp uh, so kind of eyeball them here this looks like it'll work so there's two ways to go about it I can either just find one of these that isn't bent like this one that's silver maybe try to find a black one I hate breaking up pairs or not pairs but a complete one this one looks too big or just right just right a little rusty but I think it'll work hmm. reach back and too big I just checked it on the bike so what about this one this silver one fits great we're gonna use it come on there we go so generally speaking you know when you have all black components I like to replace things with the same color but didn't really work out for us in this instance maybe I could try a little harder but 
I like this one. This, this one works pretty good. I don't like the way this is going, so we're gonna turn it around. I just dropped a little bit of lube and we'll work it in. Okay, we're good to go there. I'm gonna grab a little bit of grease here. Grease up the seat tube. And then put the post in. Tighten this down a bit. There we go. So that's fixed. Our reflector is loose one way, but we need to replace the saddle. Now's a good time to do that. So it's just a six millimeter. This is a nice easy one. They're not always this easy. I don't know why on earth the engineers would ever do this any differently than this. They really overthink things a lot. But I don't know, I guess it's everywhere, but in my life, I wanna say, especially with bikes. Yeah, I can go on and on and on about how far the industry has gone down the rabbit hole of coming up with new technology that just didn't need to happen. We're so far off course. This stuff on this bike just works so well. You know, seven, eight, nine speed stuff. I mean, seven and eight speed is my favorite. Nine speed, you start getting into different chains and you know, they, that's when it all started happening. It's like, oh, we can go nine speed, we could skinnier chain. And then everything, the compatibility is shot. Um, you know, it used to be we had Campagnolo, Shimano and Suntour, and that was it. Okay, so I didn't tighten that seat down, did I? What was I thinking? Yeah. Well, this doesn't seem to be tightening down for some reason. This old technology doesn't work. You have to get a new seat post. One of those new finagled ones that has a really great clamp on it. Jesus. <laughs> Hey, 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 what's going on here? Let's take a look. What did I do? Did something get flipped or turned or messed up somehow? Huh, it looks fine. I wonder if something got bent along the way. Hmm, I think somebody has been riding this loose for a very long time and has actually bent the clamp, the lower half of this clamp. That is not something I've ever seen, I don't think. Okay, it's got an arrow on it that's pointing forward. Can that be possible? We're gonna grease things. Sometimes I wish I could uh, Get a camera in my eyes that was like connected to my brain so you can like follow along with what I'm actually seeing and actually thinking. I do my best to explain, but I don't have someone to like hold the camera and share a brain with me or anything like that. So, but yeah, this just isn't clamping down the way it's supposed to. This is a standard generic seat clamp. And that's finger tight. And it's just, I don't see how it would ever clamp. So we're gonna go to the bins and find something else. 
see if we can find the part to work either an upper or lower part of this clamp in these bends so here's the old one or the one we're working with oh here's something that's very similar to what we've got And here's a lower. So there's something. Looks very similar to what we've got. Huh. I mean, it might be the same thing. Should we give it a shot? Let's give it a shot. Worst case is we'll find a different seat post, but you know, maybe this one would fit. It's kind of a nice one. All right, over here on the filthy bench. Here's the one that's not working. So let's try to not get everything all mixed up. I don't know. It looks fine to me. But maybe let's look for some arrows or anything. Okay, so this one looks kind of bent too. I'm going to I'm going to mix them up. See what happens. All right. So we're going to go with the old lower. And that says forward that way. It's got some grooves in it. So does that one. This is the new upper, which really doesn't look any different at all. What happens if we just kind of mock it? That's really hard to do. Okay, grab our wrench. So you turn it sideways and flip it. Okay, and that's actually grabbing it, looks like. I've never had this problem before. Okay, we're gonna go back to the bike. Back to the bike. So I'm gonna loosen this up a smidge, slide it forward, get down, and I, I always use my shelves in the background there. I was like, what is horizontal? I just set my seats on my used bikes. I just try to have them parallel with the ground maybe a little notch up but nothing to like freak anyone out all right and it's still not tightening what is going on this is probably really boring
Well, that doesn't work at all. I don't know what's happening. There's something bizarre going on here. Okay, here's what I come, came up with. I think these need to be curled up a little bit. So I'm gonna put it in the vise. See what happens here. I'm gonna get it as centered as I can. And give it a smoosh. Maybe, maybe it wants to go a different way. It seemed like it was kind of smooshing the wrong spot. All right, we're gonna give that a go. Hopefully this concavity, convexity, concave convex um, didn't change too much I swear to God I have never struggled this much with such a basic bicycle component this feels okay it's still gripping down there so It took quite a bit of force to bend that. So, I mean, the risk I'm running here, right, is that if it bends one way, it bends the other. And over time, it'll just loosen itself back up. But I think once you get everything crimped together, the rails of the saddle kind of will give some structural integrity to the whole system. So that's what I'm going with. Structural integrity has been considered, therefore we move forward. Okay, so now I can feel it's, it's tight and tightening. But I can feel the convexity and the concavity and I can see it moving. So I think I'm just bending back what I bent in the vise. We'll see what happens when we get tight. All right, that's moving in the frame. Give that a little bit extra. It's still moving in the frame, but It's a whole nother problem then. Okay. Calling it good enough. Okay, the chain is bone dry. It wants to pedal itself. So when you have a bike that wants to pedal itself, if you just squirt a little lube right down in there, this bike is a freewheel bike. Some gunk and grit got in there and it dried out over the years. And you just, little dab will do ya, and that just kind of cleans things out and lubricates it. This uh, derailleur cable's a little frayed, but not too bad. Got a little bit of a wobble to the wheel. Let's get you a shot of that. Just a little bit of a wobble. We can work that out in the chewing stand pretty easily, I think. You can hear it. That uh, freewheel sounds great.
while I have you over here, you know, I just kind of douse things sometimes. Yeah, you can see this old cheapo seven speed freewheel drivetrain hasn't been touched in 15 years probably and it still works just amazing. Um, we can make some improvements. Um, yeah, you can see here with the brakes. So, and I, um, can you see that? You can't. Hang on. You know, with the rear brake, I can squeeze it and then I let go and it's like. Brr that's just because there's uh, some corrosion in the in the lines and uh, we'll work that out in a little bit when we lube everything these tires are in decent shape and I really like the tread pattern on them so um, but there is a little bit more tread on the front um, than there is on the back so I always like to flop uh, flip-flop them when that happens um, yeah so I think the thing to do is let's pull the wheels off, swap those tires, lube the cables, clean the frame, and do what we do to bikes like this. Okay, we disconnect the brake. This skewer is all wonky. Hmm, very wonky. Dangerous, dangerously wonky. Do the same up front. Disconnect the brake. This gear is fine, a little loose. Okay, just kind of looking at things here. So I mentioned in the intro, there's some rust on this noodle. If you take a wire brush, give it some rubbing. That kind of knocks off the big stuff. And then if you grab, grab yourself a piece of steel wool, polish it right up so those little details you know make that nice and shiny that's what helps these things sell that's what people notice there's some uh, paint missing I don't know if you can see it we'll get a close-up later but there's some paint missing on this handlebar too and we can clean that up and just hit it with a little bit of touch-up paint or sometimes even a sharpie um, I don't think it's cheating um, you know, I'm not really hiding anything, I don't think. It's not functionally problematic. I'm not trying to get away with anything, just making it look a little nicer. I'm gonna just give the rear derailleur a little quick wipe here just because it's bothering me. I can't, it's, it's so dirty I can't see what's going on with it. I want to know what I'm starting with. I'm noticing some rust in the, the what you call it the crank bolts that's a little bit harder to clean up I'm sure I could fashion some sort of tool to go and clean the inside of them because it's a pretty common thing but really what you can do is just take a little bit of tri-flow a little tri-flow in there and uh, it darkens it so aesthetically looks a little better it's not as obviously rust and it keeps it from rusting in the future um, I don't know if it keeps it from but certainly slows down the process so when you have the wheels off it's really easy you can just push on the rear derailleur disconnect that cable or get it out of its cable guide and just follow the cable all the way up to the shifter 
which is has already been done by yours truly I think and then the front one um, shift down into the lowest and you just kind of pull the derailleur out and that'll help you loosen that cable so now every cable and housing is loose on this bike and I take my little bottle of triflu and here I'll see if I can give you a good shot of what that looks like so there's that ferrule but if you pull the housing out of the way you get good access and I just kind of put a few drops on it and work it in there um, you know gravity is your friend here gravity will pull the lube down into the, the cable so that's what that looks like and I just do that all along the cable generally this uh, bike you know has been neglected so there's some rust showing on the cable where it isn't in the housing um, it's just surface rust it's nothing cosmetic it's just cosmetic um, generally speaking again with some steel wool you can really clean that up and uh, make it go away that helps you really don't need a lot of lubrication for cables to work really well and then when I get them as I get them done actually now's a good time let's not put them back but I was gonna say as I get the cables done I like to put them back in their home so I know that I'm done with them but it's easier to clean the frame when everything's disconnected too so this is just cheapo lemony fresh furniture polish the generic stuff from my local market um, you can you can buy pledge if you want it works excellent but the cheap stuff at least this stuff I think works a little bit better even and it's much cheaper but still it's not like it's expensive either way but I guess every little bit helps you save five bucks it's pretty good taco these days yeah I mean four bucks a piece tacos are like four bucks a piece now you remember uh, well remember I'm sure some people are like what does it cost to get a draft beer I guess I haven't been in that game in a while but I go by taco taco costs now what does a taco cost in Missoula the maybe I should make a video on having a completely making a living through bicycles and avoiding cyclists I mean that's that's what's interesting right like seriously I tell people I'm like if you have fancy bikes go to the cycling store the only fancy bikes I like to touch are my own and boy howdy are they fancy and I'm gonna do some videos on my personal bikes my personal builds because I'm proud of them I think it's interesting and I think it's worth sharing and I think people will enjoy watching all right so I am confused already I'm redoing things oh man this brake cable was dry remember I was showing you before about how the return springs weren't even really working right well we have found a fix for that I'm noticing a little bit of a kink in the cable here too 
So all that you can feel, you know, the brake just doesn't quite, you know, snap back. Super clean, super easy. I like a really, really good brake feel. I think that's key. Oh man. Yeah, here's another really big kink right here. So if you just take your needle nose, I mean, right, the, the, the real fix here is to just replace the cable. I mean, that's if you're gonna do it. But the good enough, which I think is just fine in the practical bike world. You know, if this was a customer who was really wanting everything returned to just exactly perfect, I'd be replacing the cable and charging them for it. But it's not needed. It's not necessary. It's just not, you know, the, the cost benefit doesn't add up to me. So I do what I think, you know, is best if you take all things into consideration. All right, we're gonna, since I've, re I've lubed <laughs> this rear shifter multiple times. So I'm grabbing the, the noodle here, which by the way, looks really shiny, shiny, happy noodles. I'm dropping a couple of drops. I'm gonna get a close up of that. Aside from lubing the cable, one of the best performance upgrades you can make to any cantilever brake is a couple of drops right there in the post. And you just wiggle it and let gravity pull it down. And that's slicker than snot on a doorknob. Um, and I like to drop some back here in your brake, in the springs too. And then that lube that gets all over everything acts as a really good polish because these uh, brakes have kind of lost their luster over time. They're a little dull. And you can kind of re-lubricate that, that matte finish and it acts as a bit of a polish. Very clean, very clean. All right, back out here. Finish doing some of the rubbing. Well, it's pretty dry under there. Don't forget to polish your under, underside nether regions. You know, down in here. You know, you'll, you'll notice I, I always have a couple of rags going, some cleaner than others, and I'm just kind of always polishing along the way, both with polish and just, you know, when I spray lube and it gets all over everything, you can just kind of rub it in and the paint likes it. All right. Boom. So I say confidently that that is better than new. I think this bike right now uh, mechanically is functioning better than new. I don't think there was any lubrication added um, when this bike was assembled. It was just whatever came from the factory, which wasn't much. And after it's had its break-in period, which it certainly had, you can add some lube and everything moves more freely. And 
functions better. You can hopefully see this. Grab my steel wool. So I didn't hit this with the wire brush first, which means I gotta rub it more with steel wool. now that we have some lube on there. Sometimes a little bit of lube with the steel wool works great. Also the furniture polish with steel wool. Woo! You want to clean something. It's a good way to do it. Here we go, yo. Here we go, yo. So let's, so let's clean up the wheels, yo. How'd I do? Um, like I said, I think, I think it would behoove us to rotate the tires. I don't like saying rotate the tires on a bicycle because it seems like it's hard to rotate two of something. It's a swap. Let's swap the tires. To be precise with my language. If I would deem that as a virtue worth tending to, worth respecting, worth employing. Okay. Give her a good hug. Oh, you know what I'm seeing here is some pretty severe cracking in the rubber. I am going to put new tires on this bike. New tires sell. I am a giant dealer, which is nice because this is a giant bike and I have giant tires made by Kenda, but they say giant on them. So this bike is, has a shock on it, so it's a mountain bike, and uh, but it's going to be general purpose for the most part. So these really light knob um, tires are really nice and round, somewhat plump, they're 2.1 inches, and these don't really slow you down on the pavement a whole lot, and do really well on the gravel bike trail that we have right outside of town. So these are what I will use. And we'll go with the rear one. And I'm going to give you the, the dirty side. I'm, I'm right-handed, so I usually put this side of the wheel on my right hand because it helps me get in there to clean it. But um, maybe I'll give you that angle and show you how it gets cleaned. Go, I'll even go over to the other side. So, cleaning a hub. I really like Dawn Power Wash for this sort of thing. Just give it a little squirt. I have a somewhat clean rag, somewhat dirty, medium filth rag. I just get in there. A 
work my way around. Okay, and take a dry part of the rag and do it again. Generally, two passes is all you need. Now, some hubs are really filthy and you can hit it with a more powerful degreaser. Do three passes. So now I'm just kind of cleaning up the crossing spokes. Do that one more time. Rub the skewer a bit. And there you have it. Now we're going to do the same thing to the rim. Give her a good spin. Don't need much. Okay. Do that. And then I go right in between each one. done this once or twice. Okay, go around each edge another time. Grab a dry part of the rag. I'm starting at the reflector, then I know where to end. Sometimes you can start at the valve hole, which we just passed. It's usually opposite the reflector. There it is. Okay, and now you got a rag that's usually wet enough that you can go through and wipe your spokes down. Just go with each one, give them a quick shine. I don't worry too much about the drive side, it's pretty filthy anyway. Or not the drive side, but like, you know, back in here. If you want, you can go to town take it all apart, repack the bearings, all that kind of thing. That's another thing that kind of drives me crazy. It's like, I mean, it's happened a few times in the comments, but it just happened to me the other day. I was in the bike mobile and talking to some neighbors and they're like, what's in a tune-up? Do you like, you know, take the hubs apart and grease the bearings? You know, as if like, if I don't, I'm cutting corners. And I'm like, you know, that's an overhaul and no. <laughs> Like, I mean, I guess these older bikes you can, but um, I mean, that takes a while, you know? I don't know what it takes, 20 minutes, a half hour. And I think a lot of shops are, you know, close to $100 an hour for labor rates. So you start doing the math on that. And I mean, I guess maybe it makes sense to, you know, do that. But, you know, if it really comes down to that, just replace the wheel or find a used one somewhere, or, you know, like, I don't know. So this should give you an idea. Okay, so you can see I'm rubbing on the right. You can hear it, but you can see it's not touching. So I want to tighten the spokes on this side, these guys, and loosen this one. Actually, I'm just going to loosen this one. And that's all it takes. Now it's not rubbing. Okay, same thing here. You find the one spoke and I just, I mean, it's a quarter turn. Oh, okay, so this one's rubbing on the left. And it looks to be this one. I'm just going to loosen it a smidge. Okay. And this one. Okay. This one. You know, sometimes I tighten them, sometimes I loosen them. Just kind of depends. I got a really good feel for it after all these years. But that's the gist is, you know, the spokes are either going to the left flange of the hub or the right flange of the hub and either license, loosen or tighten. Lysen or tooten. Tucen. Lysen, tucen. Tighten, loosen. There you go. Boy, howdy. Boy, howdy, hey now. I had it, and then I lost it, so we go back. 
just one spin at a time and you got to get to a, a place where close enough is good enough um, it's always a good idea too I don't really oop. okay so here's one so I'm gonna tighten and then just back it off just a smidge because the spokes actually do twist a little bit there's a name for that if you remember the name for it post it in the comments but you know the the spokes actually do twist a little bit and then if you back god what's the name of it you're cranking on it it twists and then you kind of back it off you know so that you're actually pulling some thread but you gotta undo it and i thought of a good name for this wheel michael michael fronty So this bike had a computer on it at some point. Let me tell you about how much I hate bicycle computers. So there's like a gazillion of them out there. And they've been around since the 80s, 90s, 1990 maybe. Okay. And the whole thing is, is there's a magnet on the spoke and then a magnet on the fork or some other fixed part of the bicycle frame and then as the wheel goes around the magnet triggers a signal that goes up to the computer and there's time involved between those switches those signals okay so you have time and it's however whatever that interval of time is and that's what changes now what stays the same is the circumference of your wheel okay and the way they calculate that is the circumference of your wheel with a tire on it and its tire size now the problem with that is you never really get a true truly accurate measurement because your tires have different treads and different air pressures and all, all sorts of variables have to remain constant and they don't. They just flat out don't. Um, a tire size is gonna be different on different width rims. And you know, so it's really just a best guess. Now, in most cases, it's good enough, but it has to be programmed into that tiny little thing with two buttons on it, okay? And that tiny little thing runs on a battery and the one good thing is is most of the time the battery is your what is it cr 3230 or whatever the the you know it's a pretty standard little disc battery 30 32 30 32 um so they're widely available and so on and so forth but those batteries die and most people don't ride their bikes enough to really care and when you replace the battery, a lot of the times, now the newer-ish computers kind of remember what you had it programmed at, um, but most of the time, you know, your battery dies and you gotta reprogram it. And the general consumer isn't gonna take the time to figure it out, or they're totally unable. But for some reason, they think bicycle mechanics are magically totally able to just know and make it, it's super easy, right? And it's not, and you have to Google it. I mean, back in the day, we had a three ring binder with all of the manuals. And it's so time consuming to get these computers to work. Now, the other thing is, is that the magnets get bumped or the little sensor gets bumped and then it stops reading and customers come to you and they're like, what's going on? And you try to figure it out. And then they don't like all the wires everywhere. So they buy the wireless ones. So then you got a battery in the sensor and in the head unit. And then you have to figure out which battery has died and everything's got to line up and be just exactly perfect and program properly to get you an accurate reading I can't tell you how many i found that were like programmed to the wrong tire size and everybody thought they were going x number of miles and blah 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 but really they were going y number of miles i hate them i just think that they're so dumb and now that it is the 90s 
and we have all this wonderful technology. Um, you know, you can get a phone mount and put your phone on airplane mode and still have all the GPS compatibility or capability, sorry, capability. And, you know, download Ride with GPS or Strava or any of the free apps to give you all the data that you want that does way more than a bike computer and more accurately for less hassle, in my opinion. I mean, there's still some thinking for the technologically, you know, but it's impossible to get people to understand that. But I tell people, um, I don't touch bike computers. I won't be the last guy that touches it. I can't charge you enough to be profitable and still be fair to you. You're on your own. Google it, because that's what I would have to do. And I just have a rule. And um, I, I, when I started my business, I bought a bunch of them to sell. And I hate them so much that I gave them away and told people, you can have it, but you have to learn how to set it up. You have to learn how to install it. You have to learn how this thing works because it's going to be a headache for you for the rest of your life. And you're going to need to be able to deal with it on your own. It's like a teach a man to fish situation. So, I mean, I have a nice collection of magnets on my truing stands. You know, there's some down here. And that's all magnets that I've pulled off of front wheels off the Michael Fronties of the world. If you want, I'm just saying, if you, if you, if you're into it, you can tell everybody that the name of your front bike wheel is Michael, Michael Fronty. You can have it. You're welcome. It just occurred to me that uh, Michael Franti isn't as famous as he needs to be for that to be funny. <laughs> so, I mean, depending on the circles you run in, you may or may not want to try that out somewhere. I'm the kind of guy that I don't care. If I think it has the potential of being funny, I'm going for it. Doesn't even have to be good. Don't care. Don't care if I get a laugh or not. I'm just going to go for it. Eventually one of them will land, right? So now when I'm selling this bike, I can say new tires. And you know what else? I already, I got, we got a new saddle on it too. Okay. So new tires, new saddle. Um, I can say new grips. I'm going to put some new grips. Okay. So I just put the tube in. I'm going to under inflate it. And I'm going to check the bead. Oh, yeah. See, I just pulled it over a bunch. Probably could have put a little more air in this one, but that actually worked very well. Still under inflating. We're good. And I'm, uh, I'm a believer in the make it firm method with practical bikes. I tell my customer, tire pressure is a personal preference. If you want to pay attention to it, go right ahead. Figure out what's most comfortable, what rolls the best for you, the style of riding and what you like. Make a note of it, have a decent pump, use the same pump every time because there's a lot of variability between gauges and you can really make a science out of it if you need to. Does not bother me. But if you're going to ask me what tire pressure, my answer is enough. And that I just go by feel. And if it's firm, it's probably good enough. I'll give it a squeeze. You know? 
I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to be honest. And hopefully, you respect that enough where we can be friends. But if their eyes glass over and they look at me like a deer stuck in headlights, is that a thing that everybody knows or just us uh, northerners, midwesterners? But if they look at me like a deer stuck in headlights, then I'll look at the tire and it says right here, 65 maximum. I'll look at it and I'll look at it them and I'll say 60. And then they'll go 60. And then when I run into them a month later, I'm going to say, what's your tire pressure at, man? And they don't know. What's it supposed to be at? They didn't remember. There's no, there's no way anybody remembers that number. Everybody knows our car should be at 30, which I don't think is even accurate. Because, you know, my vans are like way higher pressure. And I've had other cars that are like 45. And the fronts are different than the backs. A lot of new cars, nothing, you know. I think the answer to the tire pressure question is look on the side of the tire if you really need to follow the rules or make it firm. It's got to it's got to be more important in a car, right? Also, um, tire direction is something we can talk about right now. Um, first of all, I always put my quick release skewers on the non-drive side of the bike. So that's how I know which way the front wheel goes. And then um, when you have tire tread, most of the time there's something resembling an arrow. And I always have that arrow pointed forward. Um, I don't know why tire manufacturers like to say there's a direction to bicycle tires. I just can't imagine that there is. But this one does have an, a direction arrow here that I noticed. Um, so left side, non-drive side of the bike, arrow's pointing this way, tread's pointing this way. We're good. The rear is a little easier. Got the drive, non-drive skewer, and the arrow's pointing forward. So we are good to go. The wheels are done. What do you say we put a bike together? Hey, here's something cool that I did. I screwed a magnet to my stand. <laughs> so good. Go to Amazon.com right now and search for like powerful magnets and then just spend like 30 bucks on your favorite ones, whatever pops up and thank me later. They come in so handy. Just all sorts of reasons to just have good magnets around. Okay, it's rubbing a little bit. Oh yeah, see how quick it stopped? Oh, I didn't lube the front yet. We're gonna wait. Okay, so let's adjust that brake. Okay, so a couple things. I've got this all lubed up and I'm squeezing it and it feels like garbage and I kind of hate it. And it's not pulling evenly. And then when I look at it, um, these pads could use some replacing. So that's just what we will do. So now we can say new saddle, new tires, new grips, and new pads. Okay, so I don't know if you'll actually be able to see how it says wear line on here. And I think we're right on it, so. Um, the other thing I'm noticing is you have two size spacers. Um, this one was over here and this one was close to the pad. So we have to remember that because that's what determines how far this pad is from the uh, brake caliper and the rim, you know, that distance and it matters. Every bike is different. So I always make a mental note of it. Um, when they come, I'll show you the new pads, the, the wider spacers always on the, on the brake pad side. 
Um, so you don't have to futz with them when it's set up that way. These we're gonna have to futz with. So also, these have this will have a little R on it. That's the right side of the bike. So that's this pad. Um, so you can see here's the wider spacers on the pad side. So I'm gonna take the nut off. Okay, and grab it like that. Get that washer off. Then this is the tricky part. Okay, you finagle it this way. I grab the nut, then I grab this washer, then I grab the spacer, then I got, grab the convex. So I grab the concave washer, convex washer. Okay. Oh, I should have done this first. Uh, <laughs> I lost it. God damn it. So then you have to figure out which part you dropped. I dropped the little washer. And it's on the floor somewhere. There it is. Nice and shiny. You know, when you drop a used one, an old one, and it's harder to find. Okay, so there's that. So, starting over. Put that on there like that. And then, you grab the nut, washer, concave, convex, just like that. Now I'm going to put a little grease on those threads. Don't need much. A little dab will do you. And then if you hit, you can just slide it on there. Okay, and then the left side. So you do that. Take that one, go there, that one, go there. Rebuild it in your hand. If anybody's got an easier way of doing this, let me know. And that's how I hold it. Oh, I guess I don't know if you saw any of that. Um, so I hold it like that just so I can psh, and then start screwing it on. So there's actually four pieces that I'm holding right there. I can't tell you how often I see, you know, people buy brake pads on online, I assume, or maybe they go to the store and buy them. Doesn't matter to me. Everybody gets all bent out of shape about that, but um, and, but they try to do it themselves and they don't get it right. Okay, so now I don't know if you can really see what I'm doing, but I always support the brake pad with my index finger. I use a three-way to grab the nut back here, and then actually, if you if you take your linear spring and disconnect it. It makes this pretty easy to do. And I go flush with the rim. Um, a lot of people like to tow their brakes. I think it gives them a really sloppy feel. I'll do it if I have to, but usually I can get these to feel really good, set up great with a nice flush, you know, snappy bang to them. And they don't, if I can get them to not squeak, that's great. If they do squeak, then I'll tow them a little bit. And you can still get them feeling pretty good with a little bit of tow. But often the amount of tow required to get brakes to stop squeaking um, gives you a really smushy brake feel. So I like hearing that. I like a snappy brake. So another um, way to cheat is you can use this spring to pull the whole system over. So I, I, I disconnected this spring. So this has no, right? So it's, everything's getting pulled that way and then you don't need to mess with it. So this is like, you just put your brake pad in place and the system is holding it flat against the rim. That's a, a nice cheat 
I think. And I'm just really kind of eyeballing it and getting it nice and centered on that rim. You don't want it too close to the tire. You know, in case things wear unevenly or something, you don't want it eventually coming up and cutting the tire. And you don't want it slipping off the rim either. So just nice and centered on the rim. Tighten it down. I'm just double checking here. And reconnect my spring. Can you even see anything there? No, back here. Okay. So, now that I have new pads, the brake's too tight, I like to use a T-handled Allen for this. I find it to be the easiest. You can see where it was originally clamped. Somebody had gone through and tightened this one once before, so we'll go back to that original spot. Okay, it's only pulling from one side. loosen this side. Starting to pull a little from that side. It's starting to lose its feel. So I'm going to tighten this side down. Actually, I tightened it down quite a bit. Now it's only pulling from that side. I'm going to add the tension back over here. Okay. Looks to kind of be hugging a little more on the left than the right. I'm going to add tension to both sides just to help me feel more comfortable about the feel. That's not something I can really show. I can just tell you that I felt like it needed more tension. There you go. So remember when in the beginning, in the intro, I was showing you how it was like, you squeeze them together and then it Now it's like boop, boop, boop. That's what, we're go that's what we're after. You can do that with, the, that was all the lubrication. You know, we lube these pivots, we lube the cable. It gets everything moving freely. New pads feel nice and snappy. And uh, adding tension also helps with that. So all of those things, we have a very nice rear brake system now. Now we lubed this chain in the beginning and I went straight with the tri-flow. A lot of times I'll use one step because it kind of acts as a cleaner and a lubricant. Um, but this chain looked to just be dry, it wasn't really dirty. But if you take an old rag and just kind of clean the gunk off, that helps. We know our cable's lubricated. We already did that. I mean, this is indexing perfectly, as expected. Man, that feels good. Okay, so with the front derailleur, I put it in the middle chain ring, and then I'm gonna shift to the low gear, and I look at the gap between the chain and the inner cage here, and it looks to be pretty big, but then I'm gonna check this one and see if we get any rubbing, and it's just about ready to rub there. So I'm gonna tighten the, um, the front derailleur cable, and I'm gonna do that with the barrel adjuster. I'll move the camera so you can see what I do. First, I'll, I'll show you what I'm trying to do is increase the gap between the chain and the derailleur. I want to pull the derailleur out just a smidge. Okay, and to do that, I'm going up to the lever to the barrel adjuster. So I want to tighten the cable, which means I want to increase this distance, right? Because if I increase the distance of the housing, that'll kind of stretch the cable a little bit. And to do that, you have to lefty loosey this guy and that is actually growing inside there. So it's, you know, if you just want to go righty tighty, 
it doesn't mean you're tightening the cable. It just means you're tightening the barrel into or the ferrule into the shifter. Um, so it's kind of backwards, but so it's like lefty tighty cable. Um, but you know, I'm just tur turning it a couple of times here. So one or two adjustments there, one or two turns to adjust there. So we increase the gap a little bit, shift down and back up again. I'm going to check. Okay, so now it looks like we're rubbing on the inside. So I'm going to loosen it just a smidge, maybe a turn, turn and a quarter, and then check the other side. Now it's equidistant on either side, and that's properly adjusted. I'm just going to check the upper limit. That's perfect. Lower is good. We're adjusted. And I don't know why I ignore the front of the bike until this point, but so here I'm just kind of lubing things. All right? The messy way with some one step. And here I'm cleaning things. I maybe did that backwards, but you know, I want the lube to soak in where the soap isn't going to get. Um, and actually, we're going to replace these pads too. So, it sometimes helps to clean them. Or it helps cleaning if you have less stuff get in the way. I have tons of brake, tons of brake parts all over my floors. If I ever drop a washer or anything, I just look on the floor. I'll find something. I sweep every once in a while. Man, I watch all these other YouTubers out there with these really clean shops. I'm like, what are you even doing? Clearly they're not like, I mean, they're just doing YouTube, I suppose. They're not actually running a business. I mean, I go into cycling stores and everything's super clean. And I'm like, how do you, I mean, they're cycling stores, so it's a retail game, but they're not making money on the service because I just can't work fast enough and be cleaning all the time. Okay. Then again, things get too far out of hand. You have a messy shop, nobody wants to deal with that. Everything's moving freely. We're going to do our brakes again. And again, we have to flip everything around with these on this bike, which is annoying. You can get some grease on the threads. Okay, this is a right pad. It's got an R on it. And we'll do the left one. So again, hey. Undo it. Try to grab the two parts I need and I'm never able to. A lot of futzing around in it. Grab the washer. Grab the spacer. A little dab of grease on the threads. Not that big of a deal, you know. Um, it's not critical. Okay. So I'm uh, kind of supporting with my knee, pushing up to make sure that this axle's fully in the dropouts. The fork ends here are called fork ends, I guess, not dropouts, but they're dropouts. And getting my skewer adjusted properly. 
which is when the lever is sticking straight out, I want it finger tight. And then the cam action of the lever will compress everything together and hold it in tight. Reconnect the front brake, squeeze it a couple times, but I don't have uh, my pads adjusted even. So that's kind of a moot point. Kind of already showed you all the tricks here. So I am gonna use that trick again. Disconnect the linear spring. Feels like it wants more tension. So I'm gonna add some to the left side here. I'm gonna add more than I need. Now it's only pulling from that side. Balance it out by adding to the right. I'm going to add a little more to the left. It's just feeling a little weak. It's pretty good. Pulling a lot of cable. A lot more than the, I like the, to have the, the front and the rear the same. So I'm gonna loosen the anchor here. Pull some cable through. You can see right there. And give it a little snug. Check the feel. And you can dial it in with the barrel adjusters. Um, this rear barrel adjuster isn't isn't even in all the way, which I like it to be. So I'm going to do that. We'll have to make an adjustment in that cable. Okay, so you see I pulled some um, cable through, and now it's not centered anymore. So we can adjust that out quick starting to feel really good. That sounded like a loose headset. That might just be the fork. I'm just gonna, off camera here, adjust the rear cable quick. get it feeling like the front. Very nice. Very, very nice. All right. Yeah, we could maybe tighten the headset a smidge. So we're going to loosen the stem clamp bolts and then tighten this. This is the preload adjustment. Just like a quarter turn. Tighten these back down. Yeah, I think it's the fork. Not a whole lot you can do about that. You could buy kits and rebuild them, but, you know, it's probably not critical. All right, and I like ergonomic grips. So I've got these giant ergonomic grips. Have a, it's just got a really nice feel to them. Some of my favorites. Here's how we do grips. We cut the old ones off. Throw them away. A lot of guys will throw a nickel 
at the bottom of their grips. Um, happens to be the same diameter or circumference or same size as most handlebars. All right, these grips were a little bit longer than the old ones, so we're gonna move our levers in. I'm gonna make a final adjustment on these when the bike's on the ground. So I'm not tightening them down all the way. Then get some cheap hairspray. Suave Max Hold. I've had this can for years. Okay. There it is. Okay. Okay, now we have the bike on the ground. I'm still not super satisfied with the seat clamp situation. That's pretty good. I'm not totally dissatisfied with it either though. Okay, so just kind of want to get my grips while they're still somewhat wet. These are drying out fast. That's always nice. Okay, this reflector is in a really dumb spot. Somehow it migrated up there. Oh, that's somebody put a computer on their bike and moved the reflector way out of the way. Yeah, computers. Have I ranted about that yet? Practical bike. Very comfortable, you know? This is the sport saddle. Now you could put, I call it a sport saddle. It's the Comfort Connect by Giant, but uh, it's got some cushion to it. You know, people, most people feel it and they're like, oh, that's good enough. But you could put even a wider saddle on this because this bike does have a nice upright feel. So um, you could put, I don't know, I, I hate to call them grandma saddles, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, that would work great, you know, put a nice comfort one. But since it does have a shock, I like to put the sport saddle on there just, you know, in case somebody feels like getting after it. But, you know, this is a nice medium size, medium large maybe. Um, so it's going to fit a lot of riders. Uh, great shifters, great brakes, new tires, new grips, new pads, new saddle. All of the things that sell bikes are on there. Um, I really do not like how short this kickstand is. So that's, I think, going to be the final touch, is replacing the kickstand. And frankly, I like to do that with the bike up against the bench. The filthy bench. So I'm not digging this whole situation for a number of reasons. This, I don't think is going to be quite as epic as the seat clamp situation, but so this has one of these weird clampers, which may or may not be what's necessary to get a kickstand on this bike. But I don't like these as much as the standard one. But sometimes it's what's needed. Okay. Let's see if we can get a regular clamp to work. Looks like it's fine. There's no cables. You want to make sure you're not pinching cables.
Yeah, it looks like it's fine. Thank God. Well, famous last words. Let's see if I can get this wrench on there. Yep. Feeling good about that. So now we have this used kickstand, but it's short, right? So this one's at 280 something. I don't know what that one's at. Well, it's probably at 280 something. Doesn't look to be a whole lot better. Yeah, I guess this bike just has a really high bottom bracket. So be it. Now I have a, a used one of these. All right, bike farmers, there you have it. The Giant Boulder SE, a wonderful all-arounder bicycle made by Giant. They're the best at it these days. Um, I am a Giant dealer. Um, their uh, Cypresses that are out right now are absolutely amazing general purpose bikes um, coming in at a decent entry level price point. So it is possible to find it out there that, uh, um, you know, just a general purpose, comfortable bike that just does what you need it to nothing fancy um but this is you know giant's always been really good at it so big fan of these um i love this one i love how it turned out i love the fact that it's got the new grips the new saddle the new pads the new tires um totally worth it on this bike um i think i can get 400 bucks for it um and um, i just love it uh, i hope whoever buys it is going to keep it forever and use it forever it's really my whole business is um, predicated on the fact that regular people are completely, completely neglected by the cycling industry. And um, there's these old bikes are where it's at. And if we can rescue them and get them super rideable and great, um, you know, it's just what families need. It's what regular people need to enjoy themselves. Get out on the bike trail, go slow, have some fun. I mean, this would be a great commuter bike too. Living in a city, you can go anywhere on this bike. Um, it's not gonna get beat up. And even if it does, you bend a wheel, you replace it for a hundred bucks and you got a perfectly good bike again. Um, you know, you just don't need all this fancy stuff that's being sold. So, ah, plenty of ethos ranting, uh, um, what do you call it, tirades. Um, but uh, yeah, if you liked this, if you learned anything, um, if you want to contribute, um, you know, subscribe to the channel, make those comments. Let's, uh, we can form a community on this if we want to, um, we can do whatever we want. We've got to do it together, but subscribe, click the notification bell. So, you know, uh, when the new videos are coming out, I'm trying to do two a week. Uh, it's pretty hard to do during the bike season. I only have a few months to really get after it here, but, uh, um, middle of July right now, it's hotter than hell outside. Uh, I had some time this morning to do one. And here it is. If you want more, um, please keep me going. Um, I love your support. I love all the comments, the likes, the, the subscriptions. Um, I'm keeping track and I uh, really want to keep this channel going for the long term. So your support's greatly appreciated. And uh, we'll see you with the next bike.